Welcome to Payne on Politics, a podcast where host Dr. Gregory Payne of Emerson College sits down with fellow experts to discuss the current state of politics, public opinion, and global affairs. In a world growing increasingly complex, communication and critical thinking is key. This only makes the Emerson motto, expression necessary to evolution, more true. Hello, this is Gregory Payne, the co-director of the Emerson Blank Karenis Center for Global Communication and chair at Communication Studies for another exciting dialogue. I say exciting because I've got a very dear friend, colleague, who was someone who helped build a bridge during a very difficult time, and it all started at Emerson. And I, without further ado, welcome Mohammed Khalil. Thank you, Dr. Payne. I appreciate that you are having me. I'm excited too to be with you in this dialogue and uh, hopefully we can uh, reflect on some of our experiences. You know, some people might say when we have these Pain on Politics episodes, uh, how is it that you two know each other? Yesterday we talked to Katie PB, who was the finance chair for Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris's presidential campaign, a very young rock star that we hope is going to be teaching fundraising for us in the fall. Mohammed, you and I are really the product of a crisis. Uh, we would never have known each other had it not been for 9-11. And of course, 9-11 was a very, very tragic episode for so many countries and so many people. But especially at Emerson, we were overrepresented, as you know, with Sonia uh, Popolo, who was the wife of uh, Don Popolo, a trustee. Sonia was a very, very important philanthropist for Emerson. And of course, the, uh, the mother of Tita, which, whom we all know. We also had Jane Simpkin, who was a graduate student in communication studies, and Myra Aronson, who was a professor in PR, all on the planes that went down that day. And I think myself, I still get somewhat choked up at the fact that, you know, those people who I knew very well, you know, in an instant were gone. And yet I had a professor uh, and a student and a friend in one part of my mind, and that night of 9-11, I had a crisis class, and I had a young, two young men, Hussam al Gusebi and someone you know very well, Faisal al Saud, come up to me and say, Dr. Payne, this is not what Saudi Arabia is about. And I'm thinking, because I was thinking of calling off class, what do you mean? And to make a long story short, they started advocating for us to take a group of Emersonians over to Saudi Arabia. Now, I think the audience needs to think about that. We've lost three people, it's 9-11, it's an event that still has changed the world today, uh, years after, and we've got a group of Emerson students saying, we need to take a group of students to a country portrayed in the media as what? The land where 15 of the 19 hijackers came from. Mm -hmm. I will say that uh, it was a difficult mission for me to accomplish talking to the administration, but we had ended up going and we took a group of uh, people, this is the first of many uh, trips. And when we got there, Prince Faisal said, here's the man who's the most important man on this trip, Mohammed Khalil. He's handling logistics, which I later knew was a code word for security. So I met you then. You've got this group of Americans coming over from Emerson. What was your thought when you first saw Dr. Payne, who I think lived up to his name in terms of what we went through, as well as the students? Actually, it's, um, you know, the initial thought that when this kind of crisis happened, the initial thought that uh, people should just disappear somehow and not do anything and keep, keep a low profile and, um, and uh, don't get into any kind of confrontation or any, ki any kind of situation where you need to negotiate um, uh, how peaceful you are or how peaceful the people there are. And um, the discussions were very hard uh, in both ways, here and there, by the way. And, um, you know, when you work in this kind of situations, uh, and I'm sure that nobody had the experience of doing the right things all the time. And because it was a unique situation, um, you have not only to talk to people to convince the administration and to get the students and, and the visitors excited about this, also you want the host to be excited about this. And not only the host, the government of the host, uh, because uh, many people there, they said, why are you doing this? This is not 
uh, this is not going to have any effect and they are going to hate us we are going to hate them um, we can do nothing to change that uh, fact and the most important thing is um, uh, let's keep keep everything apart until something positive happens and uh, of course of uh, the spirit of leadership that you extended and Faisal and uh, Prince Faisal and uh, uh, Hussam uh, that actually uh, get me excited and um, you know I, I said you know we need to do something if I have this group of people which actually um, cannot be together unless something very uh, important um, or in an important situation like this so I get excited about it and um, I had to think of uh, the logistics as you mentioned and it's not only the security is how to create a positive experience for the visitors and for the host uh, and the host families over there and that actually was uh, the starting point uh, the starting point is the spirit of leadership that you extended and that was um, uh, what got me excited about it so well you know I think you and I both have reflected after this and that is uh, I think part of it was the excitement and the passion that Hussam and Faisal had uh, for it that I felt even though man, maybe it was dealing with grief in a positive way that we needed to try and I remember talking to the president and talking to other people here and initially it was you know, as, as, as you said, it said, well, what are you talking about? But there were some supporters and we were able to do it and we were able to get there. I think when I reflect on that, though, that was a very dangerous thing uh, to do. And it was a very creative thing to do. And I guess, I mean, one thing that I would say when we did it, uh, we were the first Western group to go after 9-11, which incidentally, you know, in the later trip, we took Tita Popolo, Tita, who's mm -hmm. the only 9-11 member to go and to actually be a part of the Jet Economic Forum, in which she talked about being a bridge of peace. Why do you think Faisal and Hussam had this vision as well as, I think, the right vision to provoke and to say, let's get the dialogue going? And when you're thinking about that, what I would like to say is you mentioned that this was a very difficult conversation because we talked about Palestine we talked about America's kind of global policing strategies we talked about the resentment uh, against uh, Muslims in the United States etc and when I think about it today when we talk about what we would like to establish in Washington DC we talk about the Emerson dialogues mm. and if we have a center for global communication in Washington DC with Emerson polling doing some important research part of what we want to do and it's reflected in pizza and politics is have discussions on hard issues where we know there's going to be I would say rhetorically violent disagreements but at least keep your ears open listen to the other side and do not respond but have respect and try to just cater into the evidence arguments and claims if we think about Stephen Toolman's theories of argument so I would say the deliberative Emerson dialogues, the seeds of that began, of course, with Charles Wesley Emerson, but contemporaneously began with that trip to Saudi Arabia, where we heard the hate directed toward some of American policies, and of course, the concern and hate that some of our students had with regard to this heinous act. It wasn't people directed, it wasn't religiously directed, it was just directed at these acts, trying to figure out how we got here. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole uh, concept of uh, public diplomacy, which actually uh, you uh, teach that, I teach that sometime, and uh, the, the concept of public diplomacy is to open the dialogue and in hard issues, where actually the mainstream diplomacy can make things difficult, uh, because people like they continue uh, talking about things that away from the, any kind of conflict but uh, the uh, public diplomacy people to people um, created that environment where actually people can discuss 
uh, very hard issues, very difficult issues. And I feel um, without that kind of conversations and dialogue, you will not be able to have the creativity that we had uh, in, in, um, in conducting these visits. And not only as we started the whole thing, I mean, when we look at what we have done back uh, after September 11, uh, everybody was looking at us, um, this is not going to work. The second trip, everybody was so excited. And the third trip, actually, everybody was wanted to be part of that. So we created that uh, ripple effect. And, um, and that is basically unprecedented, not only in Saudi Arabia, also here in the United States. So the proposed center will play that role, definitely will make uh, things happen in a, in, a, in a way that is not uh, encompassed in uh, mainstream diplomacy or uh, international relations, where actually we have more people-to-people uh, -people dialogue that can create better understanding than uh, the structured way of communication. I think, uh, as you said, uh, and it, it became apparent to me when we were discussing just contemporaneously that this is the essence of what the center will be. But as you and I have said, many people say, well, why would you not just do traditional diplomacy? Well, as you know the story where I talked about going down to D.C. and actually talking to uh, Liz Cheney, who had, now I'm right now a big fan of Liz Cheney, but at the time she couldn't quite figure out why we were doing something which might not be complementary to the American uh, foreign policy, to which I said, my view is I am for American values. I embrace American values. At times I support American foreign policy, at times I don't. But I think our unique project, which was extremely exciting and very interesting. And uh, I might add that your alma mater and my alma mater, which is in Emerson's shadow across the river, Harvard, the Kennedy School, didn't get involved in these types of endeavors until two to three years later, in which they reached out to both of us and said, can you help us with the business school, Harvard Business School going? So what I like is the reason I'm at Emerson and you're at Emerson and not other places is we dare to dream. Mm -hmm. And we also try to put these together. And if we do have a failing, we fall forward and we learn from it. So I don't think that that's arrogance. I think it's just our attitude. And I think that uh, we have a track record of doing that. Now, from your perspective, what was the most difficult asset or, or challenge that you faced in putting that together. And when you're thinking of that, I'll, I'll, re I'll just reflect, and again, this is because I grew up in Southern Illinois. I remember getting up each time and we'd get out of this beautiful complex and there would be maybe two to three buses and each of the buses would hold what we were, what we had, you know, 12 or 15 people. And we didn't know until we got there which bus to take. And I remember I finally asked you, and you said, well, you know, we, we're not quite sure. Maybe one's not going to operate. Then later, I found out that there were people, you wanted to make sure we, we, had, we were secure, so we, people didn't really know what we were going to be in on any given day. Uh, yes, security back then was very important because it, it one incident can actually ruin the experience, and one wrong incident, uh, even very slight, the slightest incident can um, ruin the experience and can ruin the whole project. And um, yeah, yeah, you know, we hoped for the best and planned for the worst. That what we uh, had in mind. That not only from security part of point of view, it's also from the entertainment and education and interest point of view. So we went, we wanted to create that kind of interest within our uh, uh, our visitors, but also with the host families and the host uh, groups there uh, in different places. And as you remember, uh, in the in our third or fourth uh, group, uh, we had a lot of invitations to different places. Uh, everybody wanted to host the, um, the visitors, and, and that was um, that was a positive aspect of the experience. The most is, the scariest part and the most challenging part was that thinking of we uh, we were up to something that nobody knew how to do it.
a new experience that none of us, none of the people over there, or even here in the State Department in the United States, they knew how to do it. Uh, all the kind of concepts of people to people, building relationships away from the information and relationships actually started after 2010-2011, um, way after we did our first and, and uh, uh, subsequent uh, visits. So uh, whoever came after us, he had, they had some sort of experience, something to build on. Our challenge that we were starting, we were just walking uh, in with some sort of blindfolds and we didn't have enough idea about what could happen and what could not. But we had to plan for the worst and, ex uh, and hope for the best. And that, uh, that thought uh, stayed with us uh, most of the time. I think what's interesting to me, a couple of things I want to highlight is I've had some people say to me, well, you know, you all were duped. You didn't really get to talk to the, uh, the regular people. Uh, you just had kind of this governmental type of scenario. So you didn't really get to see the issues that faced the women at that time, as well as uh, some of the, uh, the workers, et cetera. And my response is, not true. I mean, we visited various universities. We had very candid conversations with women who expressed their concerns. I remember the one woman who was an advocate for women's rights uh, saying that uh, before she died, she was going to be able to drive in Saudi Arabia. And she pulled out a billfold and she said, here are 25 licenses that I have from countries around the world. Uh, and I'm going to have one that says Saudi Arabia. I think you remember that. Mm -hmm. So we talked to a lot of people who wanted to change uh, the system. And the other part that I would say to listeners who said, gee, it was planned, you couldn't do what you wanted to, there were times when people would say, we want to stop here. So I remember stopping at a farm uh, outside of, of Riyadh, and they didn't know we were coming. It was two women, as you remember. Mm -hmm. And it was intriguing because the women invited the women from the trip in. And so they talked and they had tea and whatever. And the men were outside underneath the, the palm trees waiting. But we could do a lot of things spontaneously. I think I would applaud you and uh, uh, Prince Faisal for that. We did meet with uh, the higher echelon, you know, we have the crown prince. Uh, this was not MBS, even though I think later we met MBS when we went to the mayor of Riyadh when he was a young, young kid. Uh, so we can talk about that later. The one thing also, Mohammed, I would like for you to talk about, and I think for people listening, we were approaching challenges that traditional diplomacy would not be able to deal with just because of the fact that they're traditional, they're historically bound. We had several students from Emerson who were Jewish who said, I want to go. Mm -hmm. And initially, of course, people thought, well, that's not going to happen. And I remember I thought, well, as much as I want to be a trailblazer, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. We talked to Faisal, we talked to Sam, and I think they talked with you, they talked, and they were allowed to come. So we, you know, that was, there were two or three. One whose grandfather was a rabbi, had a very interesting conversation with him. And so they did come. What type of a sort of a breakthrough was it at that particular time? Because now we know there is movement back and forth from Tel Aviv to Riyadh. Uh, but back in 2001, right afterwards, what did you all have to do to get that passport, American passport, that used to, if you had a Tel Aviv passport, you had to do it on a blank sheet of paper if you're going to an Arab country. This one with the Emerson, there was Tel Aviv passed, and in Riyadh, they, they did that historical stamp. How did you all master that? Because it took years later for it to actually happen diplomatically. Uh, the key was people diplomacy. The key was um, talking to, uh, you know, sometimes you want to keep some of your contacts uh, involved and engage. Uh, some of them you need to keep them away. And that um, uh, the difficult ones has been actually alienated somehow. And um, they were happy not to be included because they didn't have to make any decision. Uh, but the more progressive and um, uh, thoughtful ones were happy to assist and support. And uh, this through, if it happens through mainstream diplomacy, it will never happen. Um, but because it is people to people, um, people actually were so excited to show their good side, mm -hmm. not only um, their respect 
but their appreciation to differences and and that what actually um, helped them to make a decision um, hosting uh, people uh, with um, different stamps on their passport different religion um, uh, you know different ethnicities and and uh, they were so excited to be part of that historic movement people people wanted to be part of that movement that's why um, we gain some sort of trust and and credibility with not only with uh, uh, everyday people also with the government itself the government trusted us that we can do a good job and we can protect the interests of uh, uh, people uh, and the country in a, in a good way so it 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 needed a lot of uh, dialogue and uh, it needed a lot of uh, creativity and that's the word I, I keep repeating it is about creativity and leadership you know I think when you uh, when you talk about it from that perspective you and I both had Ronnie Heifetz over at the Kennedy School who has a book called adaptive leadership mm -hmm. and you know many times people will say well leader, this is what you do as a leader but I think what you and I were doing and Faisal was doing was trying to figure out just you know through the malaise of of what was a fog of not knowing we we tended to put together a team where we were trying to move forward what was exciting to me was, and this is one thing we practiced after going to Saudi, was the importance of food, gastro diplomacy, mm -hmm. art diplomacy. Uh, when I think of Nada Farad, who is a Saudi who uh, has her medical degree, she's an outstanding art uh, artist, which I think King Faisal or King Fahad had over 30 of her paintings. First time ever a woman was uh, commissioned to paint for the Museum of Science in, in uh, Saudi, uh, who went to Emerson and is now down in New York. All of these different ways of connecting people, building bridges, food, art, sports, etc., we tended to work on. And I, one thing I think in particular, I was teaching a course at Yale in Global Health, and we had, as you remember, several students go. And there will be, there is a documentary that we will post with this website or with the podcast uh, that people can see uh, what was made by a Yale student. But we had a, another Jewish student who was Orthodox. And again, challenges of, okay, how, how can he go to Saudi Arabia if he's Orthodox, et cetera? And yet, uh, the story that I remember is when we checked into the hotel, uh, he said, this is the food that I have to have. This is all. And I showed it to the chef, who was a devout Muslim. And the chef looked at me and said, no problem, this is what we eat, okay? Basically, this is exactly, I have no problem fixing this because this is the food. So, and I remember introducing the two of them and initially a little resistance. And I know that you and I were somewhere on a Friday, uh, which of course is the Sabbath if you're, if you're Jewish. And uh, we were, somebody, another Jewish student from Yale was coming back to do some work for, I think his name was Adam. And he had to open the door and he had to do a couple of other things. And I remember getting a call from Adam saying, you don't have to come back. And I said, well, why don't you have to come back? And he said, because I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember exactly who it was. I think it was another Faisal. Faisal, the chef, is going to do that for me. And I never will re forget remembering the picture we took at the end where both of them, devout Jewish, devout Muslim, together, arm around each other, basically agreeing, okay, food, culture, art, and both of them said, I am really appreciative of the devoutness that you have to your religion. That would never have happened Absolutely. without this trip. Absolutely. I mean, people, uh, if they don't get that kind of immersive experience, they uh, react according to their perception, and sometimes the perception is inaccurate mm -hmm. and is accumulated over time from different um, um, bad sources and inaccurate sources. Mm -hmm. And unless uh, a person has uh, have some sort of uh, um, uh, an immersive experience, people to people, direct in engagement, um, they will not be able to challenge the perception and that actually one of the uh, objectives of uh, the trips that uh, we conducted back then that we wanted people to go beyond their perception and challenge what they had in mind that has been accumulated 
from media, from what they heard from third parties and, and, and this kind of things. The bottom, the bottom line here was that uh, we created a safe environment for both the host and uh, the visitors to engage in uh, a positive dialogue. You know, I think, uh, I know that we were sort of measuring success on a de de several different uh, areas of, of how to do it. But when we came back, I think one thing that excited all of us was the first year of the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, we were inaugural members. Madeleine Albright and others had said, you know, you all had just an incredible opportunity to take a crisis and to create a bridge. And so I think one thing that I'm most proud about is the fact because of your work and your wonderful uh, abilities to sort of navigate the ground, Prince Faisal's courage as well as Hussam's courage, uh, we were able to do something that many people said you couldn't do. Uh, one thing I would say in doing it though, there was always pushback. I mean, I had a lot of pushback from people here going, how could you lose those people and then you know, take a group of students to the terrorists. Uh, I had people in high places connected with Emerson College who said on radio programs, you know, we have one professor who's a little bit too close to the royal family in Saudi Arabia, uh, which I, I guess was kind of an informal jab. Uh, my view is in order to try, and we see this in Pete's and politics and the goal of the center, bring people, desperate people together and see if you can find some commonalities. What type of pushback did Faisal, as well as others, because I know there was equally, why are you doing this? The Americans hate us anyway. Uh, so what type of reaction did you get it and how did you deal with that as Mohammed Khalil? So uh, my observation um, back then that uh, the people who were involved in the organization and who got excited about this, that they had this kind of uh, drive to go over their inhibition to explore their creativity. And um, many of them, uh, Prince Faisal and Hussam and some of the participants and uh, uh, some of the, my team, actually they, they did not get involved in this uh, because it was a job, because it was a passion. They wanted to be part of that movement as such. And, um, and uh, the notion of uh, challenging inhibitions going beyond what uh, people think about you, why are you doing this, and all the negativity that has been uh, all around all the time um, uh, created the uh, opportunities for creativity. And that what made uh, our uh, trips very successful, um, and um, not only from our uh, efforts, but from other people, everyday people efforts, like the people you mentioned in the farm there, the women uh, in the colleges, and uh, the women who actually hosted us in their homes and um, other uh, organizations and non-for-profit organizations, it created some sort of a movement. And that was so exciting for everybody. And uh, as I mentioned that when we started doing this, we were so uh, unsure of what is next. And, and that was um, uh, a sour sweet feeling that when you uh, move and trade on and feel that things are going well, you feel the power, you feel the, uh, uh, the gratitude of uh, being able to be part of that. And that was so exciting. That's why by when we ended our, uh, continued doing our program until 2010, um, um, we had a lot of sponsors, more than what, when we used to have when we started the program, not only from the United, from uh, Saudi Arabia, but also from the United States of America. Um, some organizations, big corporations actually uh, supported that effort. And, and, and that is the beauty of being not only patient, of being excited, uh, of being creative, and, and that what uh, um, made everybody um, very excited about the initiative itself. I think uh, what's exciting is I know that when we came back and when I became chair again, uh, in 2016, I said, and we'd had you before, but it was essential for you to teach 
you know, at the graduate and undergraduate level. And you've just been an outstanding professor because you bring not only that experience, but you have such a vast understanding and experience in the Sudan and that region. What is it for you, uh, Mohammed, that you find exciting and I guess that Emerson characteristic in terms of what we teach at Emerson College in the School of Communication and Department of Communication Studies? I think um, the most exciting part is that um, as a professor I'm allowed to use my uh, background experience, I'm allowed to use uh, some of my personal experiences and relate them to the students and allow them to be crea as creative as they uh, can be. Um, the, the thing that excites me about Emerson is that the students actually have the ability to um, start creating things from uh, a small uh, a piece of knowledge or uh, information they expand and they do very well and, um, and that you can find in other institutions um, that notion of creativity that notion of freedom and uh, the ability to have that mix of um, um, professional and you know uh, and academic uh, uh, background that makes things sometimes very close uh, to uh, real life experiences for our students. Well, I, I think once again, it's, uh, it's a tribute to your persistence to bring your real life experience into the classroom. I've been fortunate to know you. I think you enrich our program a great deal. And as I said when we started this, uh, the Saudi American Exchange and the, the work uh, that we did, I think is very characteristic of Emerson. And that is oftentimes our best ideas come from the faculty, but oftentimes they also come from the students who remind the faculty, this is where we need to go. So I think one thing we've seen is there's a synergistic reciprocal flow of energy at Emerson, uh, which I think at, at Harvard, there tends to be, well, the professor is all knowledgeable, et cetera. I think you and I both use our ears to listen to what's out there and we can do some creative things. What I would like to say is I do think in reflecting back on it, uh, a friend of mine in the State Department said to me, I don't think you all realize what you did when you did it, but what you did was something that we need to be doing daily, so be very proud of that. And I listened to that, and he reiterated that at the Global Summit, which we just had with Bob Woodward. So thank you, because without the team in Saudi Arabia, our team wouldn't have been able to get together because it's all about building bridges, it's all about being respectful to other points of view, and I think that the Saudi American Exchange is a great case study for what we think is going to be an outstanding contribution to Emerson, the Global Center in Washington, D.C., of which you will be an important fellow. And thank you very much for having me, and I'm grateful for this opportunity and uh, for the opportunity to engage with the students. I always tell them the best way to learn is to teach. It's not one way. Uh, we have to keep exchanging ideas, and as you mentioned, it is sometimes uh, the best ideas come, uh, come from uh, the students, and that's what we need to keep our eyes and ears open to. Thank you so much for having me. I think in closing, I also would like to say to those people listening, we are very excited uh, to have Jay Bernhardt as our new president. He comes from a very successful record as School of Communication Dean at the University of Texas. Uh, so President Bernhardt, when you uh, get to Emerson and you have some time, we'd love to have you on Paint on Politics because we're excited to be collaborative and be a very, very important part of the road ahead as we continue to distinguish Emerson College as the beacon in communication. Thanks for being here for Paint on Politics.